we're going to be talking about um, the fun topic of product safety. Uh, this is actually something that Americans for Safe Access has been working on almost since our conception, making sure that um, products that are being sold to patients are safe. So this uh, webinar is actually part of a series we're doing during August. Um, and actually, uh, we've got one more next on Thursday. We're doing the power of um, advocacy at the same time. And as we sort of do these, then the next one goes up. So you can watch um, these the series um, on YouTube. And part of um, part of this the series is that you know right now we've we've sort of moved away from uh, the the type of medical cannabis advocacy that is just you know up or down. Do you do you approve of medical cannabis? Do you like medical cannabis? And we're you know to be a medical cannabis advocate now, you really have to understand the nuances of what policy changes would look like um, and how to better advocate for those. So uh, along with these videos, we also are gonna be putting these presentations up uh, so that uh, our members and uh, supporters uh, can also give these presentations to their friends. I mean, this is the, the world of medical cannabis advocacy is um, it definitely needs a, a lot of attention. And so I wanna give people as many tools as possible. So just to introduce um, myself, I'm Steph Shear. I am the founder and president of Americans for Safe Access, uh, which I founded, uh, co-founded in 2002. And our mission is to advocate for safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. And so, you know, that's sort of a broad statement. So I think it's important to tell people, you know, what that really means to us. And it means that we're creating a world where patients only have to consider their medication in the context of their healthcare journey and not when making basic life decisions. So that means we're advocating for a regulatory framework that invests in the development and standardized cannabis-based products, ensures safe and consistent supply to those products, that fosters uh, an approach of doctors integrating cannabis into their patients' treatment as a frontline medication, encourages insurance coverage and prohibits employment, housing, parental, and healthcare discrimination. And so I wanna start off this by saying that cannabis in its natural form is, is safe. We've got you know, thousands of years of use, uh, tons of research to show that the plant itself is, is, is remarkably safe. Uh, but the where we where contamination comes in uh, is actually during the processing, you know, during cultivation, manufacturing, uh, and even through storing. And it's because there are some special things that we're going to talk about today about this plant that make it actually even more susceptible to contaminants than other agricultural products. And so, if you're purchasing cannabis from the regulated gray or illicit or a gas station these days, um, or even cultivating it yourself. Uh, you know, want to make sure that you're aware of these contaminants because, you know, the symptoms of contamination, you don't, you wouldn't necessarily uh, identify them as coming from your cannabis. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into those as well. So our, our hope with this education is that people are making informed decisions. Uh, I think in this country, if you see something being sold in a, in a, in a retail setting, uh, we make an assumption that these products are regulated uh, and that somebody is looking out to make sure um, that they're accurately labeled and that they're safe. And that's just not the the, the truth for, for cannabis in any market, which we'll, we'll talk about. And so I want to make sure that that people have the tools, one, to, you know, to at least take that risk in their own hands uh, and be mindful of what some of those symptoms and side effects are of contamination so they can make uh, choices, um, healthy choices, uh, once, once they've, uh, consumed a contaminated product. So, you know, the, can, the, the, some of the symptoms, um, and impacts of contaminated cannabis are, are pretty severe. Um, and so, you know, but they, again, they may not be something that you notice right away. They may not be something that, um, that you would associate, uh, with cannabis use. And so, you know, as you're, again, as you're, I'm not, this isn't to scare people, but really just to make sure that you're aware that if you, you know, um, are, you know, see a, a product that is open or isn't properly labeled or buying from a market that isn't testing, um, you know, that you're, you know, what, what risk you're, you're taking on. 
And so, you know, just to remember, you know, at the base of, of, of our work and as well as, you know, um, whether you're talking about the adult use market, the illicit market, um, you know, there are patients that are purchasing these, uh, these products. And so, you know, they're, you know, even more at risk uh, and more susceptible uh, to some of these side effects. Um, and we're talking about 6 million people in this country that are using medical cannabis. Um, you know, this is a, this long list here, just to make a point that there's a long list. I, I didn't, uh, I don't expect you to read it, um, but there's over a hundred medical conditions um, that are part of the state programs that, that physicians are writing recommendations for our medical professionals are writing uh, recommendations for. And so, you know, as we look at the regulations at the state level um, and, and now it looks like we're hopefully moving things at the federal level that, you know, we're, we're making sure that no matter where cannabis or can cannabinoid products are being sold, that this consumer group is, uh, is being taken into account. So we're going to start with, oh, and I should also say throughout the, the presentation, um, I'm going to take a pause and, and ask questions. So we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, you know, the whole reason we're doing the, this webinar series is to answer your questions uh, and make sure that, you know, you um, have this information and are able to, to use it in your daily life and in your advocacy. And so please, you know, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, I already know this stuff and, and I've uh, heard myself speak a lot. So um, we really feel, feel comfortable asking any questions when we get to this point. And you can put those in the chat or in the Q&A. So we're going to start with looking at where do cannabis uh, contaminants come from? I think this is important because, you know, I think people often feel like if they're cultivating their own cannabis or they know the person um, that, um, that, you know, they don't have to worry about the contaminants. Uh, I think we're hearing uh, a lot from cannabis businesses that, you know, regulations are just a way to put them out of business. Uh, and I'll say that's not um, unique of any um, uh, of, of any uh, businesses, you know, nobody, no businesses like regulations. Uh, but, it, you know, with cannabis, that just isn't true. And uh, as we'll learn, um, cannabis is more susceptible than other products to these contaminations. So cannabis is, is an agricultural product. And so, you know, whether it's grown indoors or outdoors, you know, there's all sorts of contaminations. Um, but because of a, a couple special properties in cannabis, um, you know, it is actually more susceptible. So the high water content of, of this plant at harvest makes it more susceptible to molds, mildews, um, and the, the presence of resin uh, before harvest um, you know, means that it's really grabbing every little particle out of the air, um, you know, plants that are grown outside, you know, and this is again, true for all cultural products, you know, there, there are other bugs, there's, um, other animals. Um, and so making sure that it's in a, a product safety supply chain, uh, or supply chain, um, that has product safety protocols is super important. But the other thing about this plant that's so amazing is that it's a, a bioaccumulator, which means that it can pull uh, minerals out of the soil, often that people didn't even know it was there. And so, you know, where you're planting your cannabis and the type of medium you're using to grow it is extremely important. Uh, I was actually working on a project in the Czech Republic where we did a, um, an experiment with a university where we planted uh, cannabis plants out in this field and, and tested it for everything that had ever been used in um, for over 50 years in that field. And we found that actually the plant had pulled up uh, chemicals that had not been used since before World War II. And so, you know, again, this isn't, you know, it isn't mean somebody is intentionally trying to put chemicals in your cannabis. It just means that it is a very powerful tool, which is really great for, um, you know, for brownfield cleanup, but not so great for your medicine. Uh, and, you know, the other unfortunate truth is because cannabis has such a high value, it's it's not uncommon for, um, for unscrupulous producers to either improperly use pesticides, right? Like if they've got a crop in the ground, um, they're more likely to try to save it if they're selling it to other people. And maybe that means they're putting pesticides on at the wrong time uh, that end up in the final product. Uh, we also see additives and um, adulterants added 
uh, to add weight uh, to the to the cannabis flowers um, and to um, tinctures and other things. Uh, people are adding terpenes in that are not meant for um, you know to be inhaled into the products, and they're also often diluting them um, and adding um, additives that are not meant to be consumed either um, you know uh, either eaten in, in large quantities with cannabis or uh, inhaled. And so when we think about the supply chain for cannabis at the state level, you know, you have um, you know so many opportunities for contaminants to hit this plant where you're starting at the, the cultivation um, center. Um, often the manufacturing happens in another facility. Um, there's lab testing that happens or should happen between cultivating and manufacturing. And then after the product is finished, it should be tested before it goes into a retail setting. Um, and that is under the best of circumstances, which we'll talk about in a minute that actually that's not happening in, in all the places in the regulated market, but it's absolutely not happening in the CBD and other cannabinoid market um, and the sort of illicit market, um, well, definitely an illicit market, and then the gray market that's kind of um, popped up, um, which is, you know, taking advantage of liberalized laws uh, to open retail shops that are not regulated in any way. And so during you know, each sort of step of the supply chain, there's, there's different um, opportunities for con contaminants to come into the process. So during cultivation, that's where we see pesticides, um, molds, mildew, fungus, yeast, um, heavy metals that get pulled out of the soil, um, bacteria, viruses, parasites, and foreign matter. Um, you know, it's, uh, not all um, states actually check for foreign matter, but it's pretty easy for you know, non-cannabis components to get, you know, put in with the plant during processing. During manufacturing, that's where additives and, and adulterants um, often get added, uh, also foreign matter. Um, and then I think the big thing we see with uh, the manufacturing process is actually uh, residual solvents. And that's what, what was one of the more dangerous um, of the of the contaminants. That it, you know, if during uh, the process of um, whether they're making extracts or um, concentrates, um, you know, if they're not done properly, they can leave those um, those chemicals in the product, which are very dangerous. Uh, also, during the manufacturing process, if if they're if they're creating a concentration from a cultivated, you know, from a, a plant material that's contaminated, um, those um, those contamination those, those contaminants actually get more. Um, concentrated. And so, you know, I think uh, people often talk about using a manufacturing process to get rid of them. Um, that's actually not, not the way it works. Um, and then in store it, you know, when it's stored, whether um, it's being, you know, it's waiting to be packaged or waiting to be sold, uh, it's still very susceptible of mold, mildew, fungus, yeast, um, uh, bacteria, viruses, parasites. Uh, and this can happen actually after you buy it from the store and bring it home. Um, and so you're, you know, the, when you purchase a product, you're still part of the supply chain um, and making sure that this product um, stays safe. And then if you're using old um, cartridges, uh, you know, we actually have found high heavy metal uh, content in uh, vape pens um, on old vape pens that actually um, metal actually seeps into the products. And so, um, as I said before, you know, um, cannabis, um, it, it grows in warm and humid environments, um, which happens to be the same place that micro, um, that microbes love to, um, love to grow, um, and other pests like spider mites, um, aphids, uh, thrips, they thrive in this. They like, it's like their favorite place to be. Um, and so, you know, not only are they looking at those, but if they're grown outside, then there's other pests like rodents, birds um, that, you know, um, if you're cultivating for yourself or you're buying, everyone needs to be aware of these. And there are processes that, um, that you can put in place to make sure that you're constantly monitoring these things. Um, as I you know, said before, again, the, that it's a bioaccumulator, um, it actually pulls the, you know, these minerals out of the ground and pushes them into the flower and into the leaves. So um, it doesn't just stay in the roots. It's actually, you know, 
pulls it into the plant. Um, and so um, that those heavy metals show up in, in the flower. And then um, the, then the next problem is actually trying to deal with those pests, right? Um, and there's a lot of natural um, uh, pesticides that can be used, um, that can be introduced that eat other pesticide or eat other pests. Um, but there, you know, to date, there are no pesticides that have been approved for cannabis. Now, some states have put out an approved list, um, but that has been done without any type of testing. And, you know, 100%, there's never been any testing on um, these pesticides for products that are meant for inhalation. And there have never been uh, tests on these uh, pesticides for uh, use indoors. So for during the manufacturing process, as I mentioned, you know, during the extraction process, um, this is, you know, where they're using um, butane, um, ethanol, other, other chemicals um, to pull the cannabinoids and terpenes out of the process. There's, there's other ways that um, companies can do this that are, you know, without using chemicals um, like oil or, um, or alcohol. Uh, but you know, if these aren't burned off at the pro, if they don't finish the process, um, then those can end up in the in the final product. Um, we also, you know, I think people may remember the the vaping crisis um, in 2019, 2020, and that's where people were, you know, using vitamin E uh, in in vape pens, uh, which is not meant to be used um, in, as uh, being inhaled. And so just because there's a product that is, um, on the market that is, you know, that's safe for human consumption, unless it's been tested for in inhalation, it can actually be poisonous. And we, we saw that with actually several deaths, uh, with, um, in 2019 and 2020. And then, you know, it's really common for, uh, manufacturers to buy food grade lemonine. So, you know, often terpenes, don't make it through um, the extraction process. They actually um, are um, have issues with. Um, um, sorry, there was just something weird on my computer. I got distracted. <laughs> um, so they're um, during that process. Um, you know, just so it'll smell like cannabis. Um, manufacturers put put lemonin into back into the the final product, and there is no. Uh, terpene product, unless it's been extracted from a plant um, that we know is safe for inhalation. Also say there's none of the state regulations actually require people to say that they put um, foreign um, terpenes into the, into the products. And then the storage, um, you know, it is really, you know, these, this plant has a high water content. So mold, mildew, uh, fungus, this is where they love to be. Um, light and heat and oxygen, they also affect the, the, the plant. So if you uh, bring, bring home a, a medicine and leave it in the window, the sun uh, is gonna change the terpene profile. It's gonna change the cannabinoid profile. Um, uh, you know, if you leave it open, um, just because you're, you know, you've brought it home, it doesn't mean it still can't uh, uh, get contaminated. And as I mentioned before, metals from, from old vaporizers, um, they leach into the oil. So, you know, keep an eye on, uh, on the, the dates of those products. So I'll stop there for just a second, see if there are any questions before I jump into what these uh, contaminants mean for people's health. Uh, yeah, uh, excuse me. We've got a few questions. Um, something you touched on is the, uh, the Delta eight sort of novel amp derived uh, nanoids. Um, a lot of states have started cracking down on those. How do you think that will affect product safety for cannabinoids more generally? Well, my hope is that um, is that this will drive uh, people to you know creating federal policies um, the and give um, you know, uh, regulators and, um, and, you know, the ability to enforce the laws that exist. So I think, you know, right now there's so much sort of gray area that, um, 
that uh, regulators you know, aren't sure what they're supposed to be enforcing. Um, and so you know, there are lawsuits that have happened around Delta 8 products, around um, CBD products that say that the Farm Bill has, has given people the ability to, um, to distribute these anywhere that they want. And so it's really confusing for any enforcement. And so um, the reality is, is that, you know, substances that like cannabinoids that are made synthetically that don't exist naturally in the plant in a commercial form. So what that means is that, um, you know, if within um, cannabis, there are all sorts of cannabinoids that are there and in, in levels that you can extract them uh, and utilize them. But some of these products like the THC Delta 8, they're being made either synth well, they're mostly being made synthetically. And those that makes it a new product, right? And so we actually don't know what what it means for a human um, to take THC Delta-8 in high quantities by itself. Uh, we know that for the cannabis plant, its safety profile has been established um, by people using all of those cannabinoids together with the terpenes in a, you know, in a non-concentrated form. And so Imagine if a pharmaceutical company had a compound that they just started putting out on the market and selling in gas stores that they that they made up in a lab. Um, I think people would probably be freaking out. <laughs> and so, you know, what those companies should do right now, since you know they have obviously a lot of revenue, um, is that they should actually go through the process of registering those products, the synthetic THC Delta Eight, um, to prove its safety profile. And if they do that, um, you know that they don't have to show that it has efficacy. Um, they just have to show that it's safe for human consumption, uh, and that's a pretty basic um, process here in the United States. As far as you know, any sort of if you create a new product and tell humans to consume it, you have a responsibility um, to show them that it's safe. And right now, there's a huge experiment going on on millions of people that are forced to buy those products because of the state by state. Um, uh, experiment and the, you know, the federal prohibition. Thank you. Um, we had another question touching on uh, the pesticides. Are there any other uh, countries that are doing that sort of uh, pesticide testing on cannabis that we could look to? Um, you know, there, most countries are, have just, they've just banned it. <laughs> like there's just no, like in Canada and Europe, there's no pesticides allowed. Uh, and so I don't know if anyone is doing that research. Uh, I'm guessing that pesticide companies probably are um, to show that they so they have a new market to sell them to because you know, the, um, at the, and remember other countries, they don't have the state by state um, experiment that we have here. Their federal governments are regulating uh, cannabis for, for human consumption. Um, and their approach has been just to ban uh, the use of pesticides. All right. Well, that's an easy answer. Um, <laughs> and I think we're ready to uh, move on. Fantastic. Okay. So now this is kind of the, the scary part. Um, and I, again, I this is more, I don't want to, to make people feel afraid to use cannabis, but I just want to know if you're feeling some of these symptoms, um, you know, there are steps you can take and also my, you know, being mindful of, of where you're getting your medicine. All right, so pesticides. Um, these are, you know, chemicals that are that are applied to crops to eradicate pests, um, including bugs, weeds, fungus, and rodents. And I will say that um, I've never seen a patient lobbying to get pesticides included in regulations or consumers. Um, this is something that um, the businesses are, are lobbying for. Um, and of course, you know, that's understandable. And I think that, you know, before they lobby for it, they should, should prove that it, that it's safe for human consumption. And, you know, not all States test for pesticides. Um, it's important to say like lab testing, um, like there isn't a, um, a, a pesticides test that you can do in a laboratory. Uh, you have to, um, the way that uh, testing of these products works is you have to look for something specific. So you can, you can ask these machines, is this pesticide there? But there is not a test that just says there's something, there's some type of pesticide here. And so that's also why we can't have all product safety 
protocols be left to the labs. Um, in, I mean, imagine if in the, let's say, uh, romaine lettuce, if romaine lettuce, if all of the regulations were down to um, lettuce being tested in very small batches, first of all, none of us would eat lettuce because it would be very expensive. Um, but the way that it that lettuce and other leafy vegetables are regulated is there's actually inspectors that that's that stop by while they're being cultivated um, and they look around and see what pesticides are being used. And so when those products um, are tested, um, you know, they have a better idea of what to look for. And I think, you know, this is, this is something that needs to be resourced, you know, for agriculture and, um, you know, the, um, you know, so for, for most products, they, they look and see, you know, what, um, pesticides are being sold in an area, um, you know, what, um, uh, what the, uh, you know, what products, you know, what pesticides have been ordered in an area. And so they inform, they tell the labs, you know, look for these things in these products because we're seeing them upstream. And so for pesticides, you know, unfortunately these are not things you're necessarily gonna feel right away. Um, you know, these uh, pesticides, if they're consumed, they can cause um, cancer. Um, they can cause problems in your endocrine system. They can cause problems with reproduction and, and um, reproductive, uh, development, um, and they can also cause neurological issues. And of course, you know, these impacts are actually much more severe in children, elderly, um, and individuals with comprised immune systems. And those are a lot of the people that, that fit the definition of the medical cannabis programs. And so if, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about things you can do if your state isn't testing for pesticides and to make sure that they're um, you know, regulating them and make, and enforcing uh, the regulations. So heavy metals, we mentioned that come in from the soil and from uh, vape pens. Also, you know, again, these are, these are things you're not going to feel right away, um, but they can cause learning disabilities, lower intelligence, um, you know, reduced brain development in children. Um, they can cause cell death, which is the same thing that uh, cancer does, um, and they can cause cancer, and they can affect actually cell cycle modulation, which which basically can create deformities. Um, and again, not all states are testing for heavy metals. Uh, not all states are testing for all heavy metals. And so the the only people that are actually showing up to lobby around these issues again are businesses that don't want to see heavy metal uh, testing happen. Residual solvents. So, um, you know, I think after the, the vape and scare, we started seeing more states um, test for them, but just because the state is doing some testing, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about, about the importance of, of making sure that um, the requirements for the levels, the accepted levels are the same across other, um, uh, other things for human consumption. And most of the um, the tests that have been done for ethanol, propane, and butane, like health, healthy levels in products uh, are based on products that are consumed other ways not and not inhaled. And so specific tests around inhalation really need to happen. And so um, these, you know, a lot of these you can actually feel right away. Um, so for propane, if there's still propane in, in a product, you're going to feel dizzy, ra um, have rapid heartbeat, get a headache. Ethanol is nasty stuff. I mean, if you, if there's too high levels of ethanol, they can put you in a coma, they can even kill you. Um, and butane, uh, again, severe brain damage. Um, it can cause cardiac uh, arrest or other cardiac issues. It affects the central nervous system and it can create uh, fetal uh, abnormalities. So again, you know, there's a lot of controversy about cannabis use during pregnancy uh, the cannabis part, you know, there's nothing that's going to hurt a child. It's the, the, actually the contaminants that are, that are scary. Uh, uh, Flaxotoxins are, um, they're actually, they come from fungus uh, and plants and um, they're a microbial, but they're, they're a little different and states treat them differently. And this is 
um, an area where we see, especially in Oregon, um, the uh, farmer lobby is really trying to keep the testings, uh, testing for these products to move forward. Uh, and these are, again, uh, have horrible impacts on the health. Um, they can cause cancer, they're an immune um, suppressant, they can cause birth defects, liver damage, kidney damage, and they can stunt children's growth. So, you know, again, um, this, when you, sometimes people's eyes glaze over when you start talking about regulations and, you know, this is, this is coming down to you. This is coming down to the products that, that you're using. So microbials. So this is the molds, mildews, yeasts. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of varieties of them. Um, they can cause vomiting, coma, diarrhea, um, uh, fever, abdominal cramping, seizures. So again, um, E. coli is, you know, it's not just a little stomach cramp. I mean, these have long-term effects um, that, that people need to be aware of. Salmonella is the, and I also want to say this list that we had of, of these microbials, um, this is actually has come from labs. So this is showing up in, in markets. So if it's showing up in regulated markets, we know that these are, are definitely present in markets that are not testing. Um, so also not fun, diarrhea, cramping, um, uh, gastrointestinal um, discomfort. And this is worse for children, elderly and um, compromised immune system. And people might say, you know, oh, diarrhea, that, you know, that, that's not that bad of a, of a side effect. Um, but if you have other medical conditions, um, or, um, you're a senior, uh, diarrhea can cause a lot of other complications with, um, with other medical conditions, uh, gray mold. This is, uh, also it gets in your lungs, cause sinus infections, uh, lung inflammation and allergies. I think this is one, you know, um, I would never associate unless someone told me that if I was having, you know, allergies that didn't go away, that it could be my cannabis. Um, and we also know that doctors probably aren't identifying that, you know, that these symptoms could come from someone's cannabis. Um, so yeasts still fit in the microbial category. Um, they can cause pneumonia, sinus infections, they can cause asthma and allergies. Um, aspergillus, uh, is another one, uh, again, it's kind of controversial various states, um, and is, it's a microbial, but it's usually regulated a little differently. Um, and again, this is a, a, a big target of, um, of the, especially the cultivation, uh, lobby that don't want to see testing, but, you know, sinus infections, lung infections, uh, CPA are, are pretty sim are pretty, in, you know, um, horrible symptoms to have from your medicine. I'm going to stop there for just a second before I kind of go in and, and do kind of a deep dive of what's happening in the various cannabis markets. Yeah, we had some uh, questions about state regulation. Um, I'm going to kind of merge one now. Why do you think uh, states have struggled to come up with a unified testing standard? And do you think uh, groups like CANRA have had an impact on that? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that the, you know, the more that regulators are talking, the better. I think that um, um, the, if you look at sort of the evolution of how um, cannabis laws um, and sort of the, the political side uh, of the fight for safe access, um, you know, in the, the sort of early days when we were getting the first laws passed, the product safety standards didn't exist, but we didn't have big commercial cultivation sites of what we have now. And so, you know, the product safety was was sort of secondary um, in a, for a lot of people to legal protections. And unfortunately, once patients and consumers you know, won the fight for the le you know their the legal component. They didn't necessarily stay involved in the regulatory um, aspect, and regulators have a lot on their plate. It's it's um, you know, at Americans for Safe Access, we actually teamed up with the American 
Herbal Products Association and the American Herbal Pharmacopeia to create product safety standards um, and recommendations for regulators so that they would have a guide to, to, you know, to put these in place. But it's not necessarily, um, it's not an easy task. It took us four years uh, and we went through a process of a consensus process with 175 countries. So it, it, and regulations are constantly evolving. Like you don't create a set of product safety standards for a product and then that's it. It's over. It, it, it you know, it takes resources to continue to do that. Um, and I also think like me, um, a lot of the states, you know, especially after um, we passed the CJS amendment, stopping the federal raids and, you know, under Obama, we started seeing um, agency, federal agencies start creating better policies around cannabis. I think a lot of states felt like the federal government was going to do this um, and that, you know, they were just creating these um, sort of triage programs waiting for, you know, um, more resources to come in. So that's why I think it's been a, it's been a challenge. Great. Um, I think we can uh, move on to the next one and I'll save some questions for the end here. Okay. Sounds good. So, um, American State of Access, we have been, oh, I just, I covered the website. Sorry about that. Um, we actually monitor the state laws and, and product safety is one of the, um, the areas that we monitor. And every year we put out the state of the states report uh, where we grade each of the states on patient issues. And, um, and you can download this full report um, at American Search of Safe Access, or sorry, safeaccessnow.org slash SOS. Sorry to cover that up. Um, we also put out a report this year called Regulating Patient Health, where we did a deep dive into what states are testing for. Uh, and so we can also download this report where we're actually hoping to get out a, uh, a patient's version of this, a patient's guide to contaminants. Uh, we're just waiting for resources to help us do that. Uh, this first um, uh, Regulating Health, this first uh, report is aimed at regulators, so it's very dense um, and very um, uh, policy heavy. And so we want to, you know, create more materials for different audiences. Um, but if you're curious to see what your your state is testing for, this is a great report. Uh, your regulators will love this report and love to read it. Um, your state legislators it might go a little over their head. And so we're also creating um, tools for some um, for for our advocates to lobby. Um, regulators, because it is, it's very dense, uh, for sure. Uh, and so, you know, I don't actually thought this, I took this out, sorry. I'm just going to skip over that. Sorry, for it, uh, that was a contaminant slide. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so for the state um, grades for product safety, um, even though we've been working on this for um, and states have been regulated for 26 years. When we look at the product safety standards in the regulated states for adult use and medical, um, you know, the average score among states is 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 44 percent, right? Big fat F. Uh, and the highest state this year, um, the one with the best product safety protocols, was only um, a B, 84 percent. And so what we're looking at in this is we look at the manufacturing operations, laboratory, cultivation, and dispensaries. Um, and again, you know, if you're if, if you want a guide to help you look at the regulations in your state and see what they have, um, utilizing this report card is is very helpful because there's a there's a lot there. And you know, I definitely, you know, we didn't have all of these resources in-house. And that's why we partnered with organizations like the American Herbal Products Association. Um, that has been, you know, working for decades, making sure that these, you know, that there are guidelines for both businesses and governments to regulate these products safely. Um, and so, yeah, so if you want to see where this, the various states are, um, you know, it's pretty depressing to see um, that product safety, you know, protocols are, are often sort of the last thing that people look at. Um, and again, I, you know, it, it is a big job, um, A, B, we don't see consumers advocating that much for it. And we definitely know that people with business interests are, you know, are talking to their um, elected officials about these issues. Uh, and I think everyone's waiting for the, the feds to come in. 
And so this is just looking at, you know, a, a snapshot of what various states are looking at. So there are 42 states and territories that are um, regulating cannabis and um, distribution. And most of them test for cannabinoids, although most of them are just looking at THC potency and not um, all of the cannabinoids. Um, I think the market demands at least CBD and THC, but um, uh, we haven't seen a lot of the minor cannabinoids uh, being a part of regulations. Um, 38 of them test for microbials, uh, residual solvents, 35, pesticides, 34, heavy metals, 30, um, foreign matter, as I mentioned before, only 16. Um, so again, knowing what your, your state is actually, uh, regulating, you know, is, is important to understand, you know, the, the risk that you're taking. Um, this is just that same information in a different format. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of go through these with you so you, you could see, I know that the slide I had before was pretty small. Um, so this is the, the pesticides. Um, and again, all of this is in the regulating uh, for patient health. Uh, so these are the, the, the various limits that some of the states are, are looking at. This is what EPA basically, um, you know, a lot of the states just go by what EPA says for these various um, pesticides. But as I mentioned, none of these pesticides have been tested for inhalation. I mean, not inhaling the pesticide, inhaling the product that, you, that you're using the pesticide on. Um, heavy metal testing, and just a closer look. Uh, residual solvents. Uh, and again, with these, you know, this map makes it look like it's up or down, but that's why the report is so important to really look and see that like, you know, a state may be looking for them, but they may be, um, they may have created sort of a higher category that isn't safe for human consumption. Uh, microbial testing can, uh, pretty common, but still not everywhere. Uh, flotoxin, similar, but not everywhere. And aspergillus. Um, and again, this is something that, um, uh, that we're seeing, uh, especially, you know, in states that have a really strong, um, cultivating, uh, group or historical uh, cultivation um, market, um, a lot of pushback in, the, in these regulations. All right, so I'm gonna pause for just a second, see if there are any other questions, Jeff? Um, yeah, so uh, one of the questions was um, part of uh, part of the um, issue of states doing different things. Um, could you talk about how the restrictions on where you can actually market your cannabis uh, informs that? Uh, where it actually can be marketed. So um, I'm assuming maybe you're meaning interstate commerce. Is that the? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I think that what we're what we're seeing is you know the geofencing means that it's really hard to bring anything to scale. Um, and you know, one of our biggest arguments for creating a federal medical cannabis program um, is you know just how hard it is for a business to um, you know, to get enough resources to do R and D when they're when they have this sort of geofenced marketplace. I think that's true for all of the states. Like if if we had a you know if we were looking at a market size of six million patients. I think you would see, um, you know, an, an easier justification for, you know, for R and D and and other components. But but it definitely makes a huge difference. Um, and imagine after the beginning of the pandemic, if uh, Congress would have turned to pharmaceutical companies and asked them to create a vaccine for Rhode Island, right? So we're also just not seeing um, uh, a scalable possibilities when you have everything sort of going state by state. Great. Um, I think that's all on this section. Okay. All right. So um, I think, you know, in the regulated markets, you know, patients really depend on labels. And this isn't just for, I think we all depend on labels. I mean, imagine if, if 
the if everything else you consumed, um, if the label wasn't accurate, <laughs> it would be pretty scary. I mean, just think about how many times you look at a label a day. And so for for cannabis products, um, this impact is, you know, it has real um uh you know horrible outcomes, not just to sort of short-term discomfort. So um, you know, if somebody's getting a product that they weren't expecting, um, you know, if the maybe it's too high of a THC content than they wanted, um, you know, they can have these sort of short-term effects that, you know, they won't kill you, but it definitely will give you a bad, you know, bad start to your day. Um, but for patients that are depending on specific, specific formulations, um, and they're using a product that says it's the same thing that they've been using, um, they can see a return of their symptoms. And this is really scary for patients with chronic diseases that maybe have gone off of other medications. So if a, if a symptom returns, um, it's harder to get back to the, the healthy point you were at before. Um, so backslide in that treatment success, very frustrating for patients. Um, but I think this is a, a more common one is that, you know, if you're, if you're using a product that isn't what it says it is, and it's not giving you the symptom relief, or maybe it is, um, you have made you intoxicated, um, then you can't go to school. Um, it's going to affect your work. Um, you can't take care of your kids, maybe get dinner ready. I mean, these are, these are, um, these may sound like minor impacts, um, but a disruption, like not being able to go to work can, you know, can change someone's life. And I think, you know, something we see often is you know, we hear patients talk about is that, you know, dispensaries won't let you bring something back because it's the labels inaccurate. And so instead of being able just to go into a dispensary and buy the thing, you know, will work for you, patients often have, often have to buy a few different things to see what's actually labeled correctly. Uh, and when it comes to to THC content and CBD, um, you know, people lose their jobs uh, because they test positive for THC when they thought they were taking a CBD product. Uh, and if you, you know, are depending on the label, you know, especially around intoxication um, and you, you know, take your medicine and normally you can, you have no problem driving. Um, it's pretty scary for a product to, um, to, to not be what you thought it was. So these are uh, have you know, real lasting impact for for patients and for all consumers. So we also the other part is that you know there's there's really limited cannabinoid and and terpene testing. These are the only states that require terpene testing, and terpenes have an interplay with cannabinoids that can make some you know a medicine very different. Um, and so the THC CBD content may be the same, but if they're a different terpene profile, maybe you're not going to get the same uh, therapeutic effects. Um, another one that I, that I think is super important um, is homogeneity uh, testing, which basically means that um, I think we've all seen products uh, like a chocolate bar that says that there are 10 servings uh, in that product. Um, and without this, this testing actually makes sure that you know, that there's going to be 10 milligrams in each of the servings. Um, and what often happens is there may be, um, you know, little to no THC on one end of the candy bar. Um, and you have a serving that has, um, you know, 50 of that hundred milligrams. Um, and so this is a, this is a pretty basic, um, testing, uh, that's done along anything that has an active ingredient. I mean, imagine if you bought a 12 pack of beer <laughs> and you had one beer with no, you know, or 11 beers with no, um, no alcohol content and one that um, took over your life. So um, these are things that just need to get added to regulations um, at the state level and would, would definitely be a part of the, of any federal uh, legislative process. So the thing is, is actually the, the lab component itself. So Part of um, our experiment in creating access for medical cannabis is that we've had to create a, you know, a supply chain completely outside of the other, other regulated markets. And so when we were talking about testing cannabis, uh, the normal lab infrastructure uh, was barred from being able to test cannabis. And so, you know, we saw a bunch of businesses, you know, 
kind of pop up. And I think at the, um, the regulatory level, um, they just kind of, we were just happy to have any, anyone say that they were testing cannabis. And so they're, you know, for, for many of the states there, you know, the accreditation requirements for these labs is pretty scattered. Um, there's a lack of transparency, um, around the, the chain of command, um, of, of these products. Um, there still needs to be an investment in, um, in creating standards for all product forms. So a lot of these labs are using the, you know, a formulation where they test the, the cultivated product for potency and then make an assumption of what's going to be in the final product. Um, you know, there is, you know, no, right now, no state has a proficiency program, which means that nobody is actually testing the labs. Um, and so what a lab is saying, you know, is a reading for THC at one lab could be very different than what another lab is, um, is, is saying that it is. Um, there's also, um, because cannabis testing is semi-new, um, a lot of labs say that they're process, their method for testing THC is proprietary. Um, and they're not sharing that with regulators. And so, you know, for a lot of other, um, well, in many other, uh, industries and marketplaces, um, there's no such thing, right? Your, your, um, your test for a certain test pesticide, you have to show what, what you're doing to get that test and, and, um, how you're getting the results that you're getting. And so I think, you know, I think a lot of the issues with labs will will disappear when um, uh, we change federal law, um, because we'll see you know one you know labs that are already a part of um, this these sort of regulatory um, processes will will be able to test cannabis and it will create uh, an incentive for uh, the current cannabis labs um, you know to have to sort of move in in that direction. But um, what we'll also need to pay to whether cannabis is legal at the federal level or not is looking at lab shopping. And um, obviously if, if, if we were seeing proficiency testing to make sure that every lab was using the same, uh, they don't have to use the same method, but they were getting the same result of the THC levels, then you wouldn't have this uh, phenomenon that we're seeing now where a, a business will take you know the required batch and maybe you know, take a sample to five or six labs and whichever one has the highest, gives them the highest THC content, they go with that one. Um, and so, you know, this is something we're seeing everywhere. And you can see this is this chart um, actually shows the sort of inflation of THC levels um, for, for, for certain markets. Um, so again, if, if labs were being tested, there wouldn't be the opportunity for this phenomenon. Any questions on state policy? Uh, yeah, we had a question regarding the the issues with labs that you were just talking about. Okay. Um, <laughs> what are some uh, steps that states could be taking to uh, to make sure that labs are operating on the level? Yeah, so I'm I'm actually going to get to that in in just a minute. Um, but there there are 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 regulations that they could pass very easily to like do proficiency testing, which is where you have like a, a lab um, send out a sample where they know what's in the sample to, um, to a bunch of labs, they test it. And then, so, so the machines that they're using, they have to be calibrated, right? They're there. You have to calibrate your machinery based on some standard. Um, and so the only way to do that properly is to get feedback, right? You're not in trouble. If you fail the proficiency test, it means that there's an issue with your machinery or your method that you need to change so that you're getting an accurate result. Um, and so that that's an easy one that's standard for for the the testing um, industry across anything that they're testing. Uh, and we actually have some of that the the language for that if you're interested in getting that passed in your state. Okay, so how you can protect yourself. So educate yourself and others. Like I said, you know, at ASA, we try to put out um, uh, resources for patients uh, and for um, the cannabis market uh, for ways to um, better um, 
uh, cultivate and manufacture products in a safe way, um, but also so that patients understand what the laws are and how they're impacting um, their their medicine and the products they're taking. Um, you know, if you know people within the cannabis market, um, you know, educating them, they may not know um, what the side effects are of these contaminants. Um, you know, people aren't necessarily talking to their doctors about their cannabis use. And so if they're having a negative side effect, um, you know, there's also a lot of, you know, um, stigma around um, them using medical cannabis in the first place. So maybe they're, they don't want to talk to their family or their, their doctor about it. Um, and so, you know, making sure that the, those providing medicine know that there are resources out there, um, to help them cultivate, uh, manufacture, um, and test cannabis, uh, in a more accurate, uh, safe way, um, uh, America's safe access. We have the patient focus certification program, um, where we've actually, you know, created, uh, internationally recognized standards for the entire supply chain. Uh, this program includes, uh, education for everyone and everyone in the supply chain. Um, and we also have third party uh, certification that is GMP, GAP and GLP equivalent, but, but for cannabis. Um, if, you know, if you're taking a product and you're feeling these symptoms, stop taking it. Um, you know, uh, you can tell and, and tell people, right. If you got it at a dispensary, they may not uh, do a return. Uh, but letting them know um, that, uh, that you're, you know, having symptoms from a product you got there, um, you know, they may not be nice about it, but hopefully they, they'll at least, you know, check and see before they sell it to other people. Uh, and, you know, if, if these are more of the severe symptoms or if they, they don't go away, go see a doctor. This one can be a little controversial, but, you know, shopping at, at the regulated market, you know that at least it's gone through some level of, of product safety protocols. Um, it's not perfect. They're not testing for everything. Um, but at least we know that there are some inspections, there's some um, oversight. And sorry if that isn't possible for you, we're working on it. Um, this is a big one. You know, um, not, not only a few states actually require that a, um, a retail location gives you a certificate of analysis um, that will actually show that the, that the product that you're, you're purchasing, uh, met all of the, uh, the safety protocols. Um, but I encourage people to ask, you know, it, because I think that if, um, retail operations are hearing a request for this and that, you know, actually consumers are going to go to places that actually provide the certificate of analysis, um, they have to get a copy of this when they purchase it to, to sell it to you. So why can't you see it? Um, and we actually have a guide on on actually how to how to read this labels and how to how to understand a, a certificate of analysis because it can be a little confusing. But once you understand the the, lang the language in it, then you'll you'll become a pro. Um, and again, if we're if we're constantly asking um, retailers for this information, hopefully we'll start seeing it be uh, more readily available. Uh, a few states allow you to actually bring your products directly to labs and test them for contaminants and potency. So if you're um, cultivating at, at home or uh, if you're utilizing um, unregulated market, this might be a way for you to, to make sure that you're staying safe. Um, if you uh, grow your own cannabis, um, make sure you know what is in your soil and water um, and monitor the humidity. Uh, we actually have some um, tools on our website, uh, for safe cultivation. If you're, if that's the way you're getting your medicine, uh, I said this before, but I'll say it again, don't use old vaporizers. Um, these metals, as you saw, they were some of the scariest side effects. And they're, again, they're things that you don't know. Um, you, you won't necessarily feel right away. Um, and you know, ask that your States test for, or at least, um, make companies disclose if they're using terpenes that didn't come from the plant. Uh, and keep your product stored in the dark in a cool place, um, always away from children and pets. Um, but again, you know, these contaminants can happen in your home, um, not just uh, in the in business. Any questions there before I take us to the, the end? Um, we got one more about uh... 
do, 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 do. Uh, this is something you also talked about earlier, but part of the product safety is uh, adapting to, to new things. Uh, how can we make uh, state regulations more responsive to new sort of potential hazards? Good question. I mean, I, I think a big one is, is making sure that um, the regulators are staffed and that they're spending the, the, the funds that they're getting on enforcement and not and not just staffing up for other things. Like we can write all the rules we want, um, but if somebody isn't inspecting and making sure that these rules are being followed, um, then you know what I say. What's the point? Um, and I think I feel like there's because there aren't those resources for enforcement that often regulators have thrown up their hand. They're like, why why would I add something else when I can't even enforce these regulations? So make sure you know that your state legislature is giving them the budget that they need. Any other questions? Uh, no, I think that's got us through. Okay. Um, so sorry to put this back on you guys, um, but you know, like it or not, these products are being developed for you. These marketplaces exist because of you. And if you're not demanding more, we're not going to get more. And so the, the next section I'm going to talk about and really hoping to empower you, um, you know, to to be an active participant in making sure that we see better product safety standards along the supply chain. So in Americans for Safe Access, the way that what we're seeing is that, is that we think that actually states are not going to be able um, to handle all of these changes and that we really need a federal agency um, to help with these regulations. Uh, and we're calling on Congress to create a national office of medical cannabis and cannabinoid control. Uh, and there are resources on our website about that. You can see the the, the full text of that legislation. Um, but I think it's, you know, for every state to have to try to create policies uh, for everything someone just mentioned, uh, it's it's um, resource and labor intensive. So if we, there's obviously, I feel like 6 million people using a, a commodity, we deserve, um, we deserve an office <laughs> in HHS. Um, we really need to see upstream um, safety inspections. I mentioned before, um, you know, no other commodity depends on labs as it's, you know, as one of the main points of product safety. You have to have people on the ground uh, going into these facilities to really understand what's happening and to be responsive to, um, you know, make sure that the regulations are responsive to what's happening. Um, within the sort of pesticide and adulterant arena, um, there, you know, as soon as something becomes illegal, um, there's someone there, you know, you know, removing um, part of the compound so that it can't be tested for. And so unless there are boots on the ground, you know, going into these facilities, they're gonna be really out of touch with what, what's happening within the market. As I mentioned before, you know, we've created um, comprehensive product safety standards for cannabis and hemp uh, marketplace. This is for cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and, um, and for labs. And you know, we think that states, if they can't, if they don't have the resources to go out and do the testing, then they need to require accreditation and certification um, of the testing laboratories, as well as for the entire supply chain. Um, there needs to be uh, transparency and and consumer education, right? Like every every time a patient buys a product, they should have access to the certificate of analysis. Again, if the retailer gets to see it before they buy it, um, I feel like we should as well. Um, and again, this is only going to be something we get if we if we demand it. Um, we need to see um, more regulatory oversight and enforcement. Uh, I think you'll hear a lot of times uh, cannabis businesses saying that it's just going to make cannabis more expensive um, if we see more more regulations, uh, and that just isn't true. It actually creates a a very clear standard of practices that everybody has to follow, um, and um, and creates a stable marketplace. And anytime we've seen a stable marketplace, although it, it hasn't happened very often, we see prices go down. Uh, because businesses can plan plan for the future. Uh, and uh, I think it's short-sighted for someone to ask me not to ask for product safety protocols 
um, because it's pretty expensive in my life without them. And I think it's pretty expensive for most patients and consumers to get a contaminated product. Um, and you know, a dollar extra over getting salmonella poisoning isn't, I don't think it's a major choice for a lot of people. Um, as I mentioned before, we want to see statewide proficiency testing. This would be something that would naturally happen at the federal level because this is what happens in labs in regulated markets. Um, we would love to see every state allow patients to bring uh, their cannabis directly into labs. Uh, again, uh, in our State of the States report um, and in the regulating health uh, report, we have legislative language. So if you would like to see any of these um, adopted, uh, we actually have that language. And states, you know, we made it easy for them. They can just adopt these standards um, and these regulated for the supply chain. All right, I left off the word chain. Sorry about that. Um, and this is, you know, go again, back on you, the, the, the power of the dollar is pretty important. So, um, you know, if, if product safety is important to you, you know, seek out patient focused certified products, um, you know, support the companies that are doing, um, you know, that are utilizing third party, uh, certifiers, um, uh, or people that are offering the COA. There's some businesses that, that put them up on their website, um, it's important that you know how to read them because sometimes people will put up a COA that's like two years old. And so there's a certificate analysis for every batch. So you have to check the batch numbers to make sure it's the right one. Um, but, you know, if, if a company is doing this, praise them publicly. That's, you know, let other people know. Um, you know, again, always ask retailers uh, for the COA. If you're, if you're using a delivery service, ask them, ask them to display it. Somebody, you know, in most of these regulated system, there is some type of certificate of analysis and you have a right to see it. Um, utilize the company's social media channels and customer comments um, to let them know that you that you're looking, you know, to purchase products from companies that disclose this information. So why hasn't it happened yet? Well, part of it is nobody is talking to their members of Congress or their elected officials about the, from the consumer and advocacy perspective. Um, this is actually a, a report that came out of Brookings that showed that in the primaries um, for the 2022 election, um, even though cannabis is talked about in the media every other day, or in some places twice or four times a day, um, you know, it wasn't trickling up to people running for office. Uh, in fact, 86% of candidates um, running either as Republicans or Democrats, um, didn't even mention cannabis or they, they're like blew it off. And so I know that with a, you know, 6 million patients, um, the only reason that's happening is that 6 million patients are not talking to their members of Congress about these issues. Um, and, you know, I think people often think that, you know, the legal part was all we needed to fight for. Um, we're seeing less resources in the advocacy work, you know, a lot less funding for the work that we do. Um, and I think people feel either like they're left out or that we've already won. And so, you know, if you hear people saying, oh, well, adult use has just taken over or, you know, the companies are too big, we're never going to get what we want. I want you to know that, you know, elected officials, they actually put more weight in what they hear from individual constituents than they do from lobbyists, but they can't read your mind. Um, and, you know, they're busy. They're not going to work on a controversial issue unless they have a personal connection with a constituent that's asking them to. So just remember, like, who's talking to, to your member of Congress? Who's talking to Biden? Who's talking to your state officials? Who's talking to regulators? Um, and what are their interests? You know, there are drug testing companies. There's, you know, um, uh, there's the industry part that don't want to see, you know, um, increased regulations. So, you know, if if you are not talking to them, that you know they're hearing from other people and they're hearing another perspective. And I guarantee you, product safety is not on the top of everyone's list. So we actually are running a campaign, a "What's in Your Cannabis" campaign that has included the, as I mentioned, the regulatory, the regulating patient health report. We're hoping to put out more patients more reports and materials targeted at patients and consumers. Um, and the, the goal of this is to educate consumers that this is an issue. Um, I think a lot of people, again, because, um, you know, except for the, the uh, vape crisis, 
Um, people may not be connecting um, the symptoms of contamination. They may not know that they can demand more. And so if you feel inspired, if you know, now that you feel empowered that you have this information, don't keep it to yourself. Um, uh, join us and be part of this campaign. Uh, learn more about what um, what your legislators and regulators can do to, to make sure that our products are safe. Um, and there are tools, like I said, legislative language. You can download these reports for free. Um, and we're constantly adding um, more resources to this campaign page um, as, as resources become available. Uh, this is where you can download um, the regulating patient health report. And, you know, stay in touch with us. You know, um, I think that the, um, you know, the key to this sort of next phase of, um, of patient access is keeping people informed. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, at this point, everybody in this country has had um, some type of experience with, with, with medical cannabis, uh, maybe, you know, direct or indirect. Um, and it wasn't always positive. And so, um, you know, people not only feel like they, they're informed about this issue, they feel like they're experts, um, because their nephew, um, you know, dropped out of college because of cannabis or, or their, their aunt tried a product that didn't work for her. And so, you know, this means that the education, not just about the legal component, but reminding people about the, the medical benefits of uh, cannabis, why it's so important and that could have a huge impact on the health of this nation. Um, but that's going to be up to us to make sure that people have this information. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, I think across um, all sectors, um, you know, donations to, to nonprofits are down, but for uh, medical cannabis, this has been one of some of the hardest fundraising I've ever had to do. And a big part of that is everybody thinks that we won. I think that we were so successful. I like to remind them, unless we changed our name to privileged Americans for safe access, we're not, we're not nearly done. Um, and so please, I think there, if, you, if you're on this call, you're, you're a member, um, but, you know, tell your friends and family that this is important to you and um, that everybody needs to be involved. Become a member, um, tell your friends to become members. Um, we have things like these member only events that people can join. And again, um, you can join us on Thursday. We'll be doing the power of advocacy uh, and you can watch all of these past videos and this video um, will be on YouTube on Thursday. We're also going to be putting up a version of this presentation uh, for people and doing some training. So you can give this presentation to people. Um, it, you know, I'm one person, I'm part of why we did this education series was to show you guys that these resources are available um, and would love to empower you um, to take this presentation to your um, to your city council, to your um, you know MS uh, advocacy organization, to your church, anywhere where people will listen to you. And again, thank you guys so much, Jeff. Do we have any questions before we wrap it up? No, I think we actually uh, hit them all early, so uh, I believe we're all ready. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope you join us on Thursday. Uh, and yeah, send us some feedback. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, by having this, um, you know, these resources up on YouTube for you that we can, um, you know, we can do these deep dives with more people um, that definitely help explain some of the campaign we're, we're doing. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, folks.